California is America's largest, most influential, and most powerful state. With a population nearing 40 million people, there are more people living in California than in the entirety of Canada. And with a total economy size of $3.4 trillion, California alone would be the world's fifth largest economy, ahead of even the gigantic India with 35 times the population. The two largest engines inside of California that fuel all of this economic and population success are Greater Los Angeles in the South, America's second largest urban area home to approximately 19 million people, and the San Francisco Bay Area further to the north home to approximately 8 million more. These are California's two greatest centers of population and financial power, but traveling between both of them has always been a bit of an ordeal. More than 380 miles away from each other, about the same distance as London is from Dundee, Scotland, a typical drive between Los Angeles and San Francisco takes around six hours to complete, depending on the state of traffic. The only other real choice available is to take a plane and travel an hour and a half in the air across the second busiest flight route in the entire United States. So, looking to make better options available and drawing inspiration from abroad, California back in the late 1990s began to seriously consider adding a third option, high-speed rail. And it theoretically made a lot of sense. With other large and geographically nearby cities across Europe and Asia already connected by super-fast trains, it appeared incredibly logical to connect California's two largest population centers with one as well. With the extreme economic benefits of moving people between them faster, and the environmental benefits created by lowering CO2 emissions, the project seemed like a no-brainer. Which is why, in 1996, the California High Speed Rail Authority, or CHSRA, was established to begin formally planning the project. And then, 12 years later, in 2008, California voters went to the polls and passed what became known as Proposition 1A, that set the rails into motion. But the problem is that, ever since then, the project has pretty much transformed into a quagmire of catastrophic proportions, and has become one of the biggest embarrassments in the history of the state of California. This is the story behind why high-speed rail failed in California, despite seeming to make so much sense in the beginning. In order to understand how it all went so bad, you need to understand that most of the problems have to do with the fact that Prop 1A called for some very specific guidance for how the high-speed rail system was supposed to actually work. For one, it called for very specific routes and travel time requirements. Among these requirements were that Phase 1 of the project route must link downtown San Francisco with both Los Angeles and Anaheim in the south. This route was intended to be approximately 520 miles long from end to end and completed in 2029. And along the route in between, additional cities in the California Central Valley would be connected as well, like Palmdale, Bakersfield, Fresno, Madera, and Gilroy. Later on in the following decade of the 2030s, the initial plan called for expanding this route into Phase 2, which would extend track to the north from the Central Valley towards Modesto, Stockton, and finally the state capital of Sacramento. Simultaneously in the south, Phase 2 would extend the line across the Inland Empire region and towards the southern terminus at San Diego. Upon completion, the total system length would stand at approximately 800 miles of total high-speed track, a similar length as the entirety of the high-speed rail network of the United Kingdom. But where the UK, Europe, Japan, and China have proven immensely successful in building both functioning and economically sound high-speed rail, California would ultimately prove to struggle and fail. And a lot of it is because of outrageously short-sighted politics. You see, propositions in California are incredibly serious business. Once a proposition is passed and the law is enacted, it can never be amended by the state legislature without it first going back to California voters again. Which kinda does make sense, but that also means that whatever is stated in the proposition must literally happen. 
even if it was extremely unrealistic or fanciful. And if you look at the details of Proposition 1A, a lot of it was pretty unrealistic from the start, specifically relating to the system's speed requirements. It specified that the trains operating on the lines must have an operating speed of 220 miles per hour, and a required total transit time between Los Angeles and San Francisco of just 2 hours and 40 minutes. That sounds great at first, but neither were entirely feasible objectives. For one, there aren't any trains in the world that can economically operate continuously at a sustained speed of 220 miles per hour. Sure, there are plenty of bullet trains that have shattered world records and traveled well in excess of even 300 miles per hour, but never for very long and sustained travel where efficiency is just as important as peak speed. For example, in China, some of their quickest trains once ran at 217 miles per hour, but were later reduced closer to 200 miles per hour due to the hugely increased costs of running them continuously at those faster speeds. This meant that Prop 1A, in its original form, guaranteed that the California High Speed Rail Project would struggle to be economically competitive from the start. Moreover, the trains would also simply not be allowed to operate at these super fast speeds in locations where they would be sharing the tracks with slower commuter and freight trains, likely limiting their speed in such areas to under 150 miles an hour. Likewise, in urban environments and when passing through dense cities, they would likely be required to drop their speed to even less than 100 miles an hour. All told, the slower speeds that would be necessary all over the route's course would mean that the advertised 2 hour and 40 minute journey between Los Angeles and San Francisco was simply unrealistic. And it would be far more likely to be around 4 hours or longer, depending on the number of stops that would be built in along the way. These facts essentially meant that it was nearly impossible to actually comply with the guidelines of Prop 1A, which has brought about lawsuit after lawsuit after lawsuit, as many Californians feel that they were outright lied to since the inception of the project. But it's not just the unrealistic expectations that make the California high-speed rail system so frustrating. It's also the incredibly strange routing and sequencing that the project has decided to carry out from the start. Obviously, you'd probably imagine that with the initial goal requiring the connection of Los Angeles to San Francisco, particular focus would have been given to selecting the most efficient route between them, maximizing speed and optimizing costs. But that's pretty much the exact opposite of how California has actually ended up handling things. At first, it was decided that constructing a somewhat less efficient route through the Central Valley would be appropriate in order to ensure that the 6.5 million people that live there had some access to the rail line. This included a decision to take a detour from the original plan towards the town of Palmdale, rather than routing the track more directly from Los Angeles to Bakersfield, a detour that cost an extra $5 billion, makes the total journey 12 minutes slower, and all for a town of only 150,000 people. Likewise, further to the north near San Francisco, it was decided to serve San Jose on the new main line with completely new track rather than utilizing the already built Bay Area Rapid Transit or BART system, something that was argued about relentlessly and will end up costing the project even more money, all the while making the overall trip time still longer. In the end, what was supposed to originally be quick and efficient transit from Los Angeles to San Francisco and vice versa turned into a whole bunch of political jockeying with politicians securing small wins here and there and adding extra stops in their districts at the expense of the overall statewide project. But if you thought the poor decision making would stop here, it's really only getting started. For you see, a massive project like this one really depends upon sequencing the project such that early stages could be used quickly, making direct impacts and prevent waiting decades on hugely expensive construction to finally pay off. For instance, the team could have decided that rather than laying a brand new track between Los Angeles and San Diego, an already fairly popular route, 
the already existing Amtrak track there could have just been simply upgraded. This would have cut the total trip time by 60 minutes and provided an immediate impact to commuters along this route. However, the California High Speed Rail Authority decided to instead build an entirely new route, adding an additional $7 billion to the total cost. And they haven't even started on this section yet. Nor did they decide on starting construction on any other actually useful segments for the high-speed rail line like Los Angeles to Bakersfield, or literally any other pre-existing major commuter line. Instead, the CHSR set about constructing the very first segment of the high-speed rail line between Bakersfield and Merced across the Central Valley, which at current estimates isn't even expected to open for seven more years until 2029. With a population of only 84,000 people, you've probably never even heard of Merced, and it isn't even ranked in the top 100 most populous cities in California. And yet, it is slated to become the endpoint for the first segment of the California High Speed Rail. The idea here is probably that since connecting only Merced to Bakersfield is just so ridiculous, future government leaders will be forced and incentivized to go find billions of more dollars to actually complete the project to the end goal between San Francisco and Los Angeles at nearly any cost. Which leads conveniently into my next point, the complete financial mismanagement of the entire project. From the very onset, the estimates for what this project would cost and the revenue and ridership figures that it would produce were just completely ridiculous. In 2008, immediately prior to voting on Proposition 1A, the CHSR explained to Californian voters that the entire 800-mile system, including the extensions to both Sacramento and San Diego, would cost upwards of $40 billion and funding for the project would come from three sources. State and local funds, which has the Californian taxpayers foot nearly $10 billion of the cost, federal funding, which was estimated to cover anywhere between 25 and 33% of the cost, and finally, private sector funding for all of the remaining costs, as it was estimated that the system would generate around $1 billion a year in annual profits. However, all of these initial projections from 2008 have since proven to be completely wrong. Nearly 14 years now since the passing of Prop 1A, the cost of the project has ballooned from $40 billion to nearly $100 billion due to delays, cost increases, and the slew of lawsuits thrown at the rail authority. Further, that $100 billion price tag is just for the San Francisco to Los Angeles segment of Phase 1, and isn't even to mention the Sacramento and San Diego extensions of Phase 2. And even further, the federal funding that was expected never ended up coming through, apart from a small $2.6 billion token of it that was made all the way back in 2009. The U.S. federal government never ended up creating a high-speed rail grant program as was initially expected of them by the CHSR. And then over the long term, once the system is actually up and running, it probably won't suddenly get any better. Once again, going back to Prop 1A itself and its ridiculous requirements, it states that the system is mandated to be completely self-sustainable from an operational funding standpoint, which means that it cannot require any local, state, or federal operating subsidies, which if the system ever does actually finish being built is not very likely because the CHSR authority way overestimated the amount of riders that would actually be using it. You see, high-speed rail most directly competes with airlines in markets where the distance between two destinations is around 500 miles or less. This distance is suitable because it likely doesn't take that much longer to travel by high-speed rail than hopping on an airplane. It doesn't require the hassle of visiting an airport, and it is usually a fair bit cheaper to boot. In the specific case of the Los Angeles to San Francisco route, it is expected that, if it's ever built, it'll cost roughly 17% less to take the high-speed train than to fly the same route. And when you look at European markets with similar operating dynamics, it has been determined that the vast majority of train riders will come from existing airline passengers who don't mind it taking slightly longer to travel in return for saving a bit of money. 
The only problem in California is that the CHSR is expecting that 75% of its riders will come not from airline passengers, but from people who usually make the journey by car, which historically has just not been the main demographic of people who switch to using high-speed rail. In fact, in more recent studies, it's projected that the number of annual passengers riding by 2030, when the rail line first opens, would likely be somewhere between only 23 and 31 million, instead of the 65 to 96 million that were initially projected. Alright, so where does the project stand today? Well, after 14 years since Proposition 1A, we have a high-speed rail system that is still under construction and has a very long way to go before it is ever actually operational. The CHSR Authority hopes to complete the initial 119-mile segment between Bakersfield and Merced by 2029, still a full seven years away from now. Extensions beyond these points actually linking Los Angeles and San Francisco are projected to be completed no earlier than 2033, more than a decade from now. And as far as the extensions to Sacramento and San Diego, who honestly knows? That's just so far into the future that it's effectively impossible to predict. According to a poll conducted just last month in April of 2022, however, 56% of Californians continue to support the project, while only 35% are in opposition to it. By the time the project is over, the cost per kilometer of track in California is likely to exceed $55 million. This is a construction rate that is far beyond the $20 million per kilometer of track that it takes China to build their high-speed rails, and still way above the $30 million per kilometer that Europe spends. But in all fairness to California, with its sky-high real estate prices, three major mountain ranges to cross and worry about, and soaring construction costs and inflation, it may not be all their fault. But regardless, the CHSR Authority has a massive amount of work to do in the future. The success or failure of America's first major high-speed rail system is currently hanging in the balance, and it has a lot of catching up to do with the rest of the world.